Hello again and welcome back. I'm Raj Klutke and this video will take a look at the blue wing olive hatches I fished in 2018 and see what new things can be learned from those experiences. This will be a very quick look as I've fished quite a few blue wing olive emergences in previous years and those experiences are covered in my fly fishing hatches series part 4, part 5, and part 6. You probably should review those videos first as they provide a much better overview of blue wing olives and tying instructions for the fly patterns that will be shown in this video. I'll only be covering a few minor new aspects I learned this year. In 2018, I did most of my fly fishing in two different areas, the Midwest Driftless Area and a Western trip in mid-September. We'll start with the Midwest Driftless Area, which I fished mainly in May and June. This area has gently rolling farmlands, with limestone creeks and streams. While fairly popular, it's usually easy to find relatively secluded areas, especially during the week. Probably the most important feature is that the fish are not hammered daily by fishermen using the same currently popular fly patterns. Since it's limestone country, the rivers and streams are rich in insect life. I saw many midges, caddis cases, and an occasional immature clinger nymph on the rocks I turned over from fast water areas. Blueing olive nymphs were present beneath rocks in moderate to slower currents, and occasional blueing olive adults were seen in the early afternoon, but I didn't really see a significant emergence until late afternoon and even early evening, which surprised me as earlier emergences are usually more common this time of year. In past years, we've never really seen a super hatch here but we commonly have seen relatively sparse to moderate emergences on many of the days we've been fishing. I especially like the moderate hatches best anyway, as there are enough organisms to get the fish very active, but not so many that your fly gets, gets lost in the many naturals often seen in a super hatch. When we fished this area this past year, the blue winged olives had typical small swimmer nymphs and the adults had two tails with tiny hind wings, all typical of the genus Betis. They were about a hook size 18. I got to fish the Midwest blue wing olive emergences this year in slight riffles to very flat, quiet water with slow to at one site very minimal current. I used a sparkle done mainly on riffles and a simple wrap on the flat water. Occasionally I used a pheasant tail nymph as a dropper, especially when an emergence was just starting, but generally the dun patterns work well by themselves, especially when you could see the duns riding the surface. In other words, our usual blue wing olive patterns that were described and tied in the fly fishing series, fly fishing hatches series, worked well for almost all of the emergences we fished. My most unique experience this year was around 7 p.m. on very quiet water. This is rather late for a blue wing olive emergence in the early season, so I wasn't really thinking about blue wing olive emergence. Maybe a spinner fall, but even that was problematic, as I believe, although I'm not sure, that this species of betas crawl or dive to the bottom of the stream to lay their eggs. However, I saw many rising fish clearly taking something from the surface or immediate subsurface. The larger fish were sipping, but there were aggressive rises with small fish even coming out of the water. With sipping rise forms on quiet water, I usually think of classical spinner falls or midges, but I didn't see any spinners or midges either, but especially midges can be hard to see. With the more aggressive rise forms, I wondered about a caddis emergence or caddis egg laying because of the time of day, and often you don't see the adults with caddis. But most caddis emergences and egg laying are on faster water. However, I did try blind trials of these organisms without success. Still not seeing anything on the surface, I finally strained the surface with a little net I've made specifically for this purpose and found numerous, very translucent, empty betis shucks, which are the outer nymph cases that remain after the dun emerges. I had not recognized them on the surface before catching them in my net, probably due to the translucency. I saw no duns, but there must have been an emergence upstream of where I was fishing. 
My size 20 loop wing emerger was the closest fly I had, so I tied it on, fished it in the surface, and immediately started taking fish. I had to know if the trout were really taking empty bait as shucks, so I did pump a trout, something I usually don't. Yes, the trout was full of empty beta shucks from on and in the surface. I've not seen or read about this before. Besides learning that trout will take empty shucks, I learned that straining the surface may really help even when you can't see anything on the surface. So, what lessons did I take away from my Midwestern fishing? Remember, of course, that fishing experiences are anecdotal. I learned, or actually I already knew, that emergences happen any time of day, not always at the classical times. I was also already confident that the patterns I tied in my Fly Fishing Hatches series will work well in the most common fishing situations I encountered, and likely will for you also. Most importantly, I learned again that I should minimize wasted blind fishing to a hatch by stopping fishing temporarily, if needed, to really observe what's happening and even straining the water sometimes. And most surprising, at least to me, I learned that trout do take empty shucks. The shucks can't have much nutritional value, but maybe on the quiet water the trout do get enough value to make it justified. Fishing out west was a significantly different story. As always, when we're fishing out west, there were crowds. And, at least on the Bitter Route, which is one of our favorite rivers, we saw many fishermen. I think the most important difference out west was that the fish get hammered daily by guided fishermen using popular patterns of the day. Blue-winged olive emergences are typical of the Bitter Route and the Loxa almost all year, so the fish are used to seeing blue-winged olive imitations, including in September when we were fishing the rivers this past year. On bright, Sunny afternoons, we saw no actively rising fish and only very few blue-winged olives. But on other days, we saw sparse to moderate emergences. We saw no super hatches this year, but have seen them in the past. The blue-winged olives we saw were hook-size 22 to 24 with two tails, no apparent hind wing, and had green to occasionally almost lime green bodies. We felt that these were the tiny blue-winged olives, which likely had been emerging for several weeks already. If we were correct, these were previously called pseudos from the genus Pseudochloion, which now have been reclassified into the Betis genus. They're still the same mayfly that they've always been. They are very small surface emergers, so many will have trouble breaking through the surface tension, especially on flat, quiet water stretches. In previous years, we had been very successful with our size 22 simple wrap, commonly using, for me, a size 22 WD-40 as a dropper, and for my fishing partner, a size 22 loop wing emerger. On the bitter route, and even on the Loxa, we were fishing relatively quiet water below a riffle. However, this year, the listed disadvantages of sometimes it doesn't work, doesn't always work, or, it doesn't always work, were the most important part of these slides. Remember, the current blue-winged olives had been emerging already for several weeks, and these fish were getting hammered hard daily with blue-winged olive done and emerger patterns. Many of my patterns were ignored. I even tried my small, soft hackle, which I don't think gets used as much out west, but again, it didn't really help. Ultimately, a quad pattern worked best. The smallest I had tied was a hook size 20 because the simple wrap has always worked well for smaller sizes in the past, even out west, but I had to cut my quad way down before it started to be successful. Even though more difficult to tie, I will be tying the quad for blue wing olives down to size 24 for the future. So, what did I take away about blue wing olives from this past year's trip out west? My patterns, even the ones that had worked great in previous years and on less heavily fished waters, didn't work as well this past year. I think that trout do learn, if you can say that, to avoid commonly seen fly patterns, so you should carry multiple different style patterns when fishing on heavily fished water. Size matters. 
Emerging mayflies do vary a little in size, and many fly fishermen try to use the largest hook size they can get by with. I suspect that's because it's, they're easier to handle and see. But generally, smaller is better on heavily fished waters. All these issues are magnified on flatter and quieter water. Fishing heavily fished famous waters is definitely challenging, but can be done and fish can be caught. I'm slowly getting better and sometimes really enjoy the challenge, but I still have many frustrating days on famous rivers. Some days I want less challenge and more fish. Then I go to less well-known and less heavily fished waters where my common patterns seem to work fine. I haven't decided yet whether the fly shop's current hot fly should be used or not. If truly still hot, it means it's working well at this time in these conditions. But I think trout will get used to a hot fly that everyone is using, and in time the hot fly loses its effectiveness. I don't know how to tell which stage the hot fly is in without trying it, but I like tying my own flies anyway, and often have a new pattern to try, which, at least in my mind, is a hot fly until proven otherwise. Well, I learn something new each year, and I hope you learn something also from these videos. Next time we'll discuss the trico spinner falls and the female trico emergence I fished in 2018. I'm Raj Kletke, and I'll see you soon.